Um, uh, Albert Hofmann showed signs of considerable promise very early on in that uh, he got his, um, his undergraduate degree and his PhD in only a few years of study. And uh, he entered the, the University of Zurich for, as a doctoral student and got his PhD with distinction in only one semester with only three months of research. And he achieved that by solving what had, uh, was an important problem in natural products chemistry in his day that had been worked on by professionals, professors and so forth, unsuccessfully. And that was he solved the structure of chitin, which is the structural material of which the exoskeleton of um, crustaceans and insects are made. So um, by getting a, a, the stomach contents from a, a snail that lives in vineyards, he was able to degrade chitin and show uh, that it was a, a polymer of glucose. And so that was his thesis. He was given this with distinction. And uh, then he, of course, uh, uh, received many job offers. And he had three job offers in, in all. And he chose the one that paid the least. And this is another thing I will come back to, which is also significant. Because he was following his heart. He wanted to work with plants. That had always been his dream. And uh, the other two job offers that paid better and maybe were more convenient uh, involved synthetic chemistry. And so he chose something because he wanted to do it, not because uh, this was what was the most money. So. Uh, he began working for Sandoz. He got his PhD in 1929 and also began working for Sandoz that year. The first six years, uh, Sandoz, by the way, is now called Novartis, as I'm sure most everyone knows, but then it was the Sandoz Limited firm. So uh, for the first six years, he worked uh, pretty much exclusively on, um, on cardiac glucosides, which are compounds that you may, may ring familiar digitalis or, or digitoxins. Uh, compounds like those that are in digitalis that are used to stimulate the heart, uh, very toxic compounds, um, dangerous also, and it's very important to have the pure compounds as opposed to a medicinal plant extract so that you can control the dose. Um, uh, but he was working with a European plant called Mediterranean Squill or Scylla maritima, um, and he published a series of papers on that. And then in the middle of the 1930s, on his own initiative, um, uh, he he asked to work on ergot alkaloids. Now, I'll just say a few words about ergot um, and uh, describe uh, briefly a little bit um, the chemical history. Uh, this is a parasitic fungus um, that grows on uh, mostly on cultivated rye, the most famous one, but it grows on virtually any cereal, and there are many species and uh, a couple of different genera. But the cultivated ergot or ergot of rye is Claviceps purpurea. And this was already, had been a major product of Sandoz. Um, it was involved uh, early on in, in history, at least a thousand years ago, we can be sure. Uh, there, were, uh, there were episodes of mass poisoning that looked like epidemics and were even thought to be an epidemic, some type of communicable disease, until the 17th century when it was found to be a mass poisoning because many people lived only on bread, or mostly bread, and it was contaminating the rye uh, that they was their staple food. Um, and, and this was realized only in the 1700s, late 1600s, that it was a fungus growing on the rye. Uh, but even so, this existed as a problem in the world up until the 20th century. In, in what was the Soviet Union, there were outbreaks into the 20th century. It may have occurred in antiquity, but we can't be sure. And so, um, uh, there were early attempts starting uh, in about 1816, 1875, were the first chemical attempts to isolate active principles from this. But the first really significant um, uh, event was in 1907, um, the, Brit the, Brit the Britons, Barger and Carr, um, isolated the first crystalline product from ergot that showed pharmacological activity, but unfortunately it was more toxic than anything else, and they called it ergotoxine. And 11 years later, in 1918, Arthur Stoll, who was Albert Hofmann's direct superior or boss in Sandoz, isolated ergotamine, which was the first really successful pharmaceutical product in pure form from ergot. Um, and this was, w was used, uh, has been used in a various uh, realms of medicine, but I'll, s I'll say more about that when we get on in the story. And so uh, after 1918, Sandoz had a good business in ergotamine, but they stopped researching it uh, at some point in the 1920s. 
And so Albert went to Stoll's boss and said, I want to work on Urgot. And he said, fine. And, and so uh, then he immediately requisitioned a half a gram of ergotamine from the production department. And his boss showed up in the lab very angry and said, you can't have a half a gram of my expensive product. You better find some other way to get your starting material for your research. And so he turned to the ergotoxine, uh, uh, which Sandoz also produced. And it was kind of like um, secondary waste matter, in a way, from the um, ergotamine production. And so he began studying this ergotoxine uh, mixture at, at the same time as he was trying to isolate, break it down, and get pure lysergic acid. The, um, these alkaloids, or well, the other significant uh, chemical fact about them that precedes this is that very year, 1935, Jacobs and Craig in the United States had shown that lysergic acid was the building block of all of these alkaloids in ergot. The name lysergic comes from lysis or cleavage of ergot alkaloids. And so they broke them down, and they had this common nucleus, lysergic acid. And I'll say more about that. And so uh, alkaloids like LSD are built up from lysergic acid. And um, so he, Albert was isolating lysergic acid for his chemical synthesis experiments from this ergotoxine. But in the process, he showed that ergotoxine, although it would crystallize, this sometimes happens in chemistry, was not pure and homogeneous. But in fact, it turned out to be three different alkaloids, really uh, four, because one of them had two isomeric forms. And so uh, that was a very significant um, finding. And the, one of the alkaloids was already known and had been isolated uh, just uh, around 1935 also, and that was ergocrystine, also in Sandoz. But the other two turned out to be new, and that was ergocornine and ergocryptine. And, um, and ergocryptine was later found to exist in two mirror images, two isomeric forms, alpha and beta. So um, Albert was able to get this um, lysergic acid starting material while he was in the process of, of separating these three components or four components of the ergotoxine uh, mixture. And so his first um, big project with this was in 1935, not only did Jacobs and Craig find this lysergic acid, but in four different laboratories, one of them being the Sandoz laboratories, but also in, simultaneously in the United States, in France, and in Britain, and here in Basel, um, another alkaloid was isolated from ergot that is called mostly ergonovine. It has like four names. Here they called it ergobasine. But uh, to eliminate the confusion, and because four people discovered it at once, they just put a new name, which is the new ergot alkaloid, ergonovine. ergonovine. And this is uh, distinctive from ergotamine and the ergotoxine alkaloids in that it is water soluble. The others are soluble in organic solvents. And also uh, that it showed the specifically uterotonic or oxytocic effects of ergot. And by that, I mean um, one of the common uses and what led to scientific study of ergot is that uh, it was actually in the United States that this entered academic medicine. John Stearns, a, a physician from Philadelphia, learned from a German midwife, um, Hev Amann, that, um, that uh, ergot was used to induce childbirth, to induce uterine contractions. And this effect is called uterotonic, or we now also call it oxytocic because there is a hormone oxytocin that produces this effect. So it acts like oxytocin on the uterus. And so, but on, this had tremendous value uh, in obstetrics, and this was not toxic, uh, not at all. Uh, not like ergotoxin and ergotamine with significant um, toxicity problems in higher doses. But the problem was it didn't occur, it was a trace alkaloid in ergot. And so, um, so Albert's first synthetic project was to make ergonovine synthetically. And he did this in 1936. And in the process, uh, Jacobs and uh, Craig had proposed its structure was um, lysergic acid propanol amid. And uh, he proved this to be the structure by making it synthetically. And so this had significant um, economic value because now this ergonovine could be made synthetically. But unfortunately, it couldn't be patented. Um, because it was already in the open literature and there were many pretenders to the throne. So he went on synthesizing other alkaloids. Now, in LSD, my problem child, LSD, mein Sorgenkind, um, Albert, I think, is a little excessively modest in, uh, in that he takes credit for, for having developed three pharmaceutical preparations 
in his career, uh, or su what he calls successful pharmaceutical preparations, in his career as a chemist. Well, I'm going to present the idea that I think there were really nine, not just three, and I'll enumerate those and, um, and say a little bit about them. So, as I said, he made already in 1936 ergonavine or ergobacin, as they called it in Sandoz, synthetically. This was the first synthesis ever of any ergot alkaloid. So that's a significant thing in chemical research. It was also proving the structure of, um, of this alkaloid because the way you prove the structure is you say, okay, I think it's made of these elements, so then you build it up from those elements and show that you can synthesize it. Um, and it was of economic value, as I said, because now uh, trace alkaloids could be produced from waste matter like the ergotoxine mixture. Okay, so then Albert went on. Meanwhile, he had separated out the three alkaloids from uh, ergotoxine, the ergocornine, uh, ergocryptine, and ergocrystine. Um, and so he made dihydroderivatives of those, uh, and that's the famous mixture hydrogen. And, uh, and this was a tremendously valuable product which could be patented and was patented um, and which made many, many, many billions of uh, euros, dollars, euros, uh, whatever you want to uh, nominate in for, for the company. And in fact, um, hydrogen has been off patent since already 40 some years and it's still one of the top 20 leading pharmaceuticals in the world. Um, and I, I'll say a little bit more about that business side later. So uh, this was, um, uh, uh, and these, uh, this is a mixture of the dihydroderivatives of these three ergotoxine alkaloids. Now the, it still sells, as I say, in the top 20, but it must compete with many generic um, versions, uh, copycat versions, because the patents have long since run out. Uh, and, and by analogy to this, about at the same time, he made dihydroergotamine, which is um, a, a variant, a semi-synthetic variant of sh the ergotamine alkaloid that Stoll discovered. That was also patented and is also still on the market as a pharmaceutical, although it's not as big a market as hydrogen. Um, that's dihydroergotamine. And uh, that's used as a circulatory remedy and for stabilizing blood pressure. And more or less in these same years, in the late 30s, uh, and this is all pre-LSD um, days, he also synthesized a variant of this ergonavine, this water-soluble alkaloid, which came to be called methergine, and that's instead of the propanolamide of lysergic acid, it's the butanolamide, so it has one more carbon atom tacked on the uh, amine group. And uh, this is the third one that Albert takes credit for in his book, and this is indeed still on the market. Um, and it's used in obstetrics, and it is mainly used now not for in inducing uterine contractions because oxytocin itself is used for that, but it's used to stop postpartum hemorrhage, and it's a very effective life-saving medicament for hemorrhage in the uterus uh, uh, after birth. So um, these are the three uh, medicines that Albert took credit for, and indeed he developed them single-handedly, all by himself, I mean, and nowadays, uh, if someone is lucky in a long career as a pharmaceutical chemist, they might work on a team that makes one drug that it gets approved, and, and there surely are some other examples, but uh, it's almost uh, singular that one s single chemist working by himself would have produced three products that were patented and, and indeed are even still being sold many years after the patents have run out. So, um, but I said there were nine. These are only three. Well, as a direct outgrowth of this research, even though Albert maybe didn't do the final steps of the synthesis, but uh, for example, there was another product called um, Sansert or Deseril, uh, which was made by his assistant, Troxler. Um, and this follows along in the same range of research and working under Albert, although he was the first author on the paper. And this is the famous, it's been called anti-serotonin. Uh, um, and it's, it's been uh, at least as significant as a research tool as it has been as a, as a medicine, but it's used as a medicine as an anti-migraine. So, so that's, uh, there are three groups of three. So first we had hydrogen, methogen, and dihydrogot. So now we have the Sansert or Deseril, as uh, it's known in different countries under different names. Now then there's another one, Parladel or Pindalol. It's also, uh, sorry, CB154 or Parladel. And uh, this is, going back to the ergotoxin, sorry about the chemical nomenclature, but I said there was this ergocryptine was one of the three alkaloids he separated out from this mixture, 
and that had two isomers, alpha and beta. Well, this is a bromo, two bromo derivative of alpha ergocryptine. Um, and it was called CB154, and it was made in this same series, uh, but, uh, and Albert Hofmann did uh, personally make this one, but by an odd quirk of fate, this is a, an interesting uh, point, um, they didn't, they were lacking some data or had gotten lost or something when they published the paper in 1943 on all of these compounds. And once you publish it in the open literature, you cannot patent it. And so because they didn't have the data, they didn't publish it in 1943, and only much later was it, did they find a use for it. And so had they published it in 1943, it might never have become a successful pharmaceutical because no one knew what to do with it in those days. But as scientific research advanced, much later, it was found to be a, a potentially very valuable compound, and it's used as a, an anti-Parkinson, uh, Parkinsonian, and, um, and so it came to be patented under the name of another worker much later when Albert was around retirement age. And so, but uh, that's also certainly to his credit, so that's the second of the second group of three. And similarly, um, the same co-worker, Troxler, but this time with Albert as co-author, made another uh, successful uh, patented drug called Visken or Pindolol. And this happens to be a 4-hydroxyindole derivative that came directly out of the research on the mushrooms. Uh, the, the psilocin is the active principle of the mushroom. That's 4-hydroxy-DMT. And 4-hydroxyindoles are not at all common in natural products. Um, and uh, this uh, simple indoles, and this happened to grow out of that. And so, um, and this was also uh, patented much later, um, and uh, is more, and Albert mostly gives credit to his coworker Troxler for this. Uh, but this is used as an antihypertensive and also um, in glaucoma. So then we have this second group of three, basically, successful uh, money making drugs. And, I don't know if you know much about the pharmaceutical industry, but in most countries now, it's very difficult to get a new medicine approved, and many people will work their whole career and, and not have anything but dry holes. But so that's the second group of three, Sansert, Parladel, and Viscan. Okay, and so there are three more. Well, how about Delicid and Indocybin? Do those ring a bell? Um, Delicid is the trade name for lysergic acid diethylamide, D-lysergic acid diethylamide. And indeed, um, Sandoz intended, this was patented in the same paper in, uh, 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 right before they published that 1943 paper, and so it was on patent up until about 1960 or so. Um, and Sandoz intended to sell this as a medicine, and it was, it's a fabulous one, uh, take it from me, or well, you don't, probably don't have to take it from me. Um, <laughs> But uh, what they had in mind was uh, two uh, very good ideas. One of them was um, they had these 100 microgram famous, Christian showed a, a slide, um, of ones that had already been, had the top taken off and were empty. Um, but uh, they made 100 microgram ampules, um, and they could be injected, and sometimes they were injected, but it was basically designed for oral ingestion, and it was just a protective measure to put it in the glass ampules. Um, against oxidation, um, but also they made, and, and the, the therapeutic indication for this in their prospectus, which they made and published in several languages, uh, were, was twofold. It was for psychotherapy, uh, for an aid in uh, uh, um, psychic loosening, as was mentioned earlier by Ralph, I think, um, this afternoon. Um, and also possibly in the training of psychiatrists because they had this idea um, of the model psychosis and so forth and, and also maybe, you know, give psychiatrists a taste of their own medicine. Let's make them, you know, take it first. Um, and so I had no offense to the psychiatrist. Um, and so uh, that was the, the indication for the 100 microgram ampules. And the other one was um, 25 microgram pills. And, uh, and this was designed as a stimulant um, uh, for depression. This is brilliant, and this is something that we really need. Because at that dose, it's very much like amphetamine, but without the side effects, without any nervousness, a slight hint of something other than just the stimulation. But it's very difficult to tell the, the body effect of a low dose of LSD from, from a good amphetamine like methamphetamine. Um, uh, and yet it's, uh, it didn't have quite the tolerance problem. And uh, so that was, um, Delicid certainly deserves to count. And, and also Indocybin, the same thing was repeated later. Uh, I mentioned in my earlier talk 
that the mushrooms that Gordon Wasson had rediscovered with Maria Sabina in Mexico in 1955 found their way here to Basel, and Albert isolated uh, psilocybin and psilocin, and Sandoz, for similar reasons, intended to market psilocybin as indocybin, indo for indo and also for Indians. So they had, they had five milligram pills of uh, indocybin, and then they had 25 microgram um, pills, uh, and also um, the 100 microgram um, solutions of delicid. And so th I don't think there's, a, even though Sandoz certainly didn't make any money off of indocybin and delicid, I know a hell of a lot of other people that did make a hell of a lot of money <laughs> off of it. And I don't think many people here would deny that these were really successful pharmaceutical discoveries by Albert Hofmann. Um, and so, so he certainly gets, so that's two more. We're up to eight now. And uh, what's the ninth one? Well, oddly enough, reserpine. Um, this is another interesting story about bad business judgment um, on the part of Sandoz. It happens that Albert started uh, studying Rawolfia serpentina also in the 50s, the snake root. And he historically, although he doesn't get credit for it because it's the publisher parish rule, but he became the first one historically to isolate reserpine from the Rawolfia serpentina, the snake root. Um, and the people at Sandoz said, no, no, that's no good. Uh, we'll just shelve that. And so he doesn't even get to publish it. because, uh, And so meanwhile, Siba patented it in 1958, and it was a revolutionary medicine in, um, in, in early psychiatric chemotherapy. So those are the nine uh, substances that, so really he participated in, uh, directly and um, in some cases single-handedly because indocybin and delicid were also virtually single-handed and reserping in the discovery of nine successful major modern pharmaceuticals, um, basically all of which are still on the market in one form or another. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I can see I'm going to run out of time here. Well, that's not unusual. Okay. So I'll just say a couple more words about and other scientific discoveries along the way, and this is a little bit more technical, but I wouldn't want to leave it out. Um, in the process of doing this synthetic work, people were puzzling over the structure of lysergic acid because it's not a simple uh, compound at all, um, and especially the peptide alkaloids like ergotamine and so forth. And so um, Albert and his group basically um, derived the correct structural formula and the stereochemistry, which is to say the three-dimensional configuration of, of something that is, is uh, asymmetric, which means it can have mirror images um, that are not superimposable but have the same relation of parts um, uh, for lysergic acid. And so that was a major discovery, and I know it's a point of pride to Albert that, that an, the American chemist Woodward, who uh, won the Nobel Prize, uh, was a competitor, and he had proposed a wrong structure, and, uh, which Albert was later uh, uh, happy to correct. Um, and also, he later uh, conducted with his group at Sandoz the total synthesis of ergotamine to prove this, uh, this structure in stereochemistry. So those were major contributions in natural products chemistry that don't have this economic or business or, or medicinal uh, dimension to them. And finally, on, on that note, um, he also uh, participated on the chemical side in the development of the fermentation of ergot alkaloids because in the... In the early days, they started using wild ergot that was, uh, came mostly from Spain and Portugal. And so this was separated out of the rye. Anytime you grow, I used to grow mushrooms on rye grain, and you can get f from seed rye, you can get a couple handfuls of ergots out of a, a 50 kilo sack. Um, and so they, if it's produced for seed or for animal feed, they don't take the ergot out. If it's for bread or for whiskey, in Canada they just grow it for whiskey now. Um, they take that out. Man, maybe they should leave it in. <laughs> Who knows? And so, um, so this was done for many years, but then as the, the volume of sales grew with these alkaloids, uh, thanks to, uh, in no small measure, Albert Hofmann, they began to intentionally inoculate rye fields with ascospores of the claviceps and, and hand collect, the, here in Switzerland, hand collect the ergots, um, so they contracted farmers to grow rye and intentionally infected. I'm sure the other rye growers in the neighborhood loved it, and uh, intentionally infected the rye fields. 
But it, the, it's a big market now. It's produced in ton quantities. Uh, this was not small, though. They, they, uh, even when it was wild collected ergot, it was a couple hundred tons a year were, were collected and sold. Um, and so not something you carry in your Volkswagen. And so, um, so they developed a procedure to grow this in big tanks in a factory, just as penicillium mold would be grown for, for producing uh, um, antibiotics. And so uh, Albert participated in this also, and there was intense competition. There were patents from several different companies, but Sandoz came out on top. And they ended up, through Albert's screening, finding a strain of ergot that produced almost pure lysergic acid with nothing else. It had a slight variant from lysergic acid and not a, lot, a profile. Often there can be 20 alkaloids in these strains. It was from Portugal also, I believe. And so now it is produced in a factory in Germany in ton quantities. Okay, uh, in closing, I want to say something about, I mentioned uh, the subjects of intuition and ethics. I'll leave out the bioassay side because uh, I don't have the time, and surely other people will talk about it, but Albert also advanced greatly the Hefter technique that Dave Nichols mentioned this afternoon. I call it the Hefter technique. Well, he mentioned in the context of Arthur Hefter doing self-experiments with the four alkaloids he had isolated from peyote, uh, lophophora with the AMSI, in order to ascertain which uh, would be the visionary principle of the cactus, because uh, you can't see this effect in research animals, and it's not so easy to see it in, in, um, in a friend, even, from the outside, maybe even not in oneself. Uh, and so I, I suppose you can, I have to have once forgotten that I've taken it, and, uh, but not for long. <laughs> and so, so Albert did a, a whole series, uh, at least uh, 30 compounds he tested systematically. And unfortunately, I've not been able to get him to write this up. I've even offered to do the heavy lifting because he's only written up the ones that worked. But we need to know the ones that didn't work also. <laughs> save a lot of time and, you know, drilling dry holes in the future. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, finally, one more thing before I, I close with the intuition and ethics. Uh, he played a significant role in the Salvia Divinorum story also, in that he went to uh, Mexico in 1962 with R. Gordon Wasson, and they brought back identifiable specimens. This had been known for a couple decades before this, not well known, um, but it was not identified botanically and named until they brought these specimens back, but they brought back live material that was cultivated and all the subsequent uh, chemical work done on it came from this live material, and this was sold on the on the plant market in the early days, even back in the um, 1970s. It was available well before there were smart shops or shamanic plant uh, dealers, and so that's another significant thing. Even though he did chemical research on the salvia that was not fruitful, he did the bioassays there in Mexico, but the extracts he brought back with him, following the lead of the Mazdecs, didn't work. And so he couldn't see the activity in his lab, so he was not able to isolate the active principle. So um, in closing, I just want to say, uh, mention two things. One, uh, as uh, far as his contribution to the role of intuition in research, and the other as far as his contribution to ethics in research. Um, as to intuition, um, the LSD story is striking. I mean, the, hi the, the, the textbooks of uh, scientific history are going to have to be changed. Because uh, they commonly give as the classic scientific example of intuition in research, Auguste Kekule's um, hypnagogic state on a streetcar or tram, um, and, and then he fell half asleep, and he had a dream of a serpent with its tail in his mouth, and this gave him the clue to the structure of benzene, because people were trying to figure out how the six carbon atoms of benzene were interrelated, and nobody considered that they might be in a ring, that these things could close on themselves and be cycles. And, uh, and so, um, but Albert's story is much more impressive than that, in that he had synthesized this molecule, and uh, everyone celebrates the history based on when he discovered the effect, but in fact it was first made five years earlier in 1938. And so we've celebrated the, the, the the, um, the history dates kind of five years late each time. We need to add a five onto the, but that upsets people's sense of order with a nice, you know, 50, 60, and so forth. So, um, so he made this, and then he gave it to the Sandos. He followed the rules. He gave it to the pharmaceutical department, and they said, nah, this is no good. So they tried it, and it was uterotonic, but 
the other compound they already had was better, it was stronger, so no advantage there. And so there was nothing interesting in these research animals to them. But the only research animal that they had that was capable of discovering this effect was Albert Hofmann. And, and, uh, and the only reason he stepped up to the plate to do that is because of intuition. So um, he said, he's, uh, I've talked to him many times about this, and sometimes he just spontaneously brings it up. But he said things like, and these are more or less direct quotes, he liked the structure, uh, or that he would have dreams about the structure, visualizing you know, the way he thought the, the molecule would link up and, and look and so forth. And so, um, so this is the example of uh, intuition. And he said he had a striking presentiment that it had some activity they hadn't discovered. So he made it again in 1943. And that is when he a accidentally, quote unquote, became inebriated and discovered the activity. And finally, um, uh, I want to cite in conclusion uh, for the ethical side, um, well, first, the ethics of choosing the job that pays the least, um, and where would that have led him? You can see where it led him here. Um, on 11 October 1962, he conducted a very classical scientific experiment, which to my knowledge is unparalleled in the long history of pharmacognosy. And that is, he went back to Mexico with R. Gordon Wasson to seek out Maria Savina, who had given Wasson the knowledge about the mushrooms that enabled Hofmann to isolate psilocybin or indocybin. And he brought back the pills of indocybin to Maria Savina to test them on her, who was really a collaborator in this research. And so to him, the only way to really validate this uh, isolation work was if Maria Savina gave the okay to this substance. 11 October 1962, and she did. And so I'm sorry, I think I didn't leave time for questions, but uh, thank you for your attention.